Amen, amen, amen. A um, few years ago, here's where I'm going to start. A few years ago, we did a, a preaching series here at Grace, and it was called Unfollow God. Kind of a provocative title, isn't it? Um, it's, it's kind of a social media idea, and it's, it, it, it almost, uh, in, in a sense, makes it sound like we're saying unfollow God. That's not the point. We're just, what we're saying is people unfollow God. There are people who are close to God, know God, and at some point along the way in their faith, they decide to walk away from Jesus. And so we explored four big reasons why people sometimes walk away from the church and walk away with Jesus. And we took a week preaching on every single one of those. I would recommend going back and finding this one. It was a very interesting series to do. Here is the first reason. I'm just going to give you an overview. Number one, I transitioned to adulthood. That's why I unfollowed God. I, I, I entered this period of time where this had been my parents' faith. And I was raised in the church, but I wasn't sure whether or not I believed everything that mom and dad believed in. The world was asking some questions. My professors were asking some questions. My friends were asking questions. I wasn't sure if I had the answers to those. And so I set about to find it for myself. And so maybe I walked away from the church for a season in order to rediscover. Next one was I faced the hypocrisy and the ugliness of Christians. Ever been there? Amen. Uh, you saw hypocrisy in the church itself. You saw the ugliness of some Christians' views. Ever go on to social media? It doesn't take long to see it. There are some things that are being said by people who call themselves Christians that I would not agree with and you would not agree with. But especially when we're just figuring out faith, sometimes we lump it all together, don't we? And we think, my goodness, if I'm a Christian, if I'm a Bible-believing Christian, maybe that means I have to believe that. And that doesn't seem right to me. And so you walked away, you felt lumped in, you didn't want to be lumped in with some of that stuff. Maybe you were hurt by the church. Maybe you were hurt directly by a church leader. Maybe you were in a spot of uh, brokenness or weakness or even a sinful lifestyle. And you feel like you look back and you're like, the church overreacted to me. And they judged me harshly. And so you left. Maybe that's the spot that you were in. Maybe you experienced tragedy. That's the third one. I experienced tragedy. Somebody... Somebody passed away. I lost someone. Um, and I didn't expect to. And I never imagined that if I loved God and God loved me, that God would ever let me have that much pain in my life. And when I hit that spot and I asked my why questions, I didn't get my why questions answered. And so I walked away. And it could have been something like a divorce for you or a job loss for you, but it was, it was this tragedy in your life where you started to have conflicted feelings about pain and God. The fourth one is life just got busy. Life just got busy. So common. Uh, work happened. Uh, an ambitious career happened. Kids happened. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves not having time or space to get ourselves to church. And as we didn't get ourselves to church, our, our love for God started to dim. They say you can worship God on a golf course, and maybe, maybe you can. Often you're not, but maybe you can. But there's something about being with the people of God and being surrounded by their by their joy and by their worship and by their faith that not only holds us accountable, but inspires us to stay strong in the Lord. And when you walk away from that, it can be very, very tough on your walk with God. So even though that series, two years ago, even though that series was about literally walking away from God and following God and hopefully coming back, I bring it up today because I think some of us, maybe your story wasn't that you actually walked away from God. Maybe your feelings just got complicated instead. Maybe you were super excited, super passionate. Your faith was super strong at a point in time. And then one of, or many of those things happened to you. And then you started to get complicated feelings. You started to not 
love the Lord, not have the same kind of joy that you once had. See, we're in this series right now called I Like You. And this I Like You series is all about this idea of I might say to you, hey, I love you, but I don't like you very much right now. And we've been saying that every single week because it applies to your marriages and it applies to you and your kids. And today it applies to God. And one of the things that we've said is when you say, I love you, but I don't like you, no one ever felt loved by those words. Ever. Because we all know what's being said there. We all know that people are trying to pull two things apart that kind of don't really pull apart. Because if you don't like me, I'm not sure that you do love me. And I'm not sure I want to settle for a love that doesn't like me because I want to be liked. Come on, second service. Yeah, that's how we feel. And so in our relationship with God, one of the things we looked at with, especially when we were going through the parenting portion, was that we parent liking our kids, not just loving them, because God likes us, doesn't just love us. God is the perfect parent. Do you know he likes you? Amen. God likes you. Um, he said, do not fear little flock for it gives your father great pleasure to bring you the kingdom and to give you the kingdom. Amen. We looked at Zephaniah where God sings songs over us in his joy and his protection over us. The fact that he knows the number of hairs on your head because he's so individual, he's so passionate. He's so preoccupied even with you. And so we want to return that love and that like and that passion. Amen? Now it gets complicated because I just gave you a whole host of reasons why you might not feel that way. And, and, and some of those reasons I'm going to try to give tiny answers to. It's, it's not the main focus today is trying to help you onto your path of healing. But I'll give you just a little bit before we move on. Number one, I don't make light of hurt. Some of you guys have gone through deep things. But one of the things I would like to ask you, because I think, I think there's a thought here that might be helpful and maybe even healing for you to get on the right path of healing, is this. Is it possible that what happened to, to you in the past, you have taken your feelings and your hurt toward a group of broken sinners in the church, and you've mixed the guilt of that with God's character? that you've put God together with his people and called them both guilty. And we put those things together mistakenly in our hearts, right? As we're trying to process through pain, but part of the path of healing, this is a logical point, but it is a decision that I am going to see the character of God and his love for me as different from the way that his people sometimes behave. Because can we be real about the church? Can we be real about broken sinners? And we're all in this. But some days we wake up and we do not do it right. And sometimes we woke up and we didn't do it right to you. Can we own that? And, and, And part of us all trying to figure our way forward is trying to say, God was not with them in that. Hmm. Another thing to consider if, if, Maybe for you, it was the death and the tragedy and losing a loved one and asking God your questions why. I'll just say this. I've been trying to follow Jesus for about 30 years now. And I've known a lot of people. And I've seen a lot of people go through crisis and go through their dark night of the soul. And man, and it's it's a deeply mysterious place. The ones that go through that dark night of the soul and they get closer to God or they find their healing, this is one thing that I always see them do. The choice I always see them make is they lay down their why questions to the Lord and they decide to trust. And some of you have heard from others that sometimes you'll ask your why questions to the Lord and sometimes he'll give you reasons why. But most of the time, the reasons don't come He gives you himself instead. And he asks you to trust him. And in that kind of pain, I say this with fear and trembling to you, to make the choice to trust him anyway 
it's, it's the path to peace. It's the path to healing. I don't want to make light of it. It's the path that Job took, Abraham took, Joseph took, all the saints did. I want to give you a word that we're going to use quite a bit today. The word is conflate. Say conflate. Conflate. Um, It's a word that one of our elders, Kobe Edwards, uses with me a lot. Don't conflate these two things. Don't mix these two things when they shouldn't be mixed. Conflate just means to mix some things like ingredients and make a new thing. And, and, and the, the real, if, if, if you get into this, the Latin beneath it is to, to it, it's like inflate, but conflate. It's, it's to blow together two different things, almost like you would, you would blow glass together and you would fuse two different objects together into one. There's, there's so much fun stuff there. But anyway, you're mixing stuff. And sometimes you're conflating or mixing some things that shouldn't be mixed. Again, like the guilt of God's people and the guilt of God himself. You've conflated those two things. And and, and the way forward toward healing is to separate those two things back out again. One of the things I think for us as Christians, one of the reasons that we lose some of the passion and the love for God that we used to have is because we've conflated some other things. For instance, we, we conflate being a servant of God and being the friend of God. We conflate obedience and duty with loving and liking and adoring God. And sometimes we bring all those things together and say they're the same thing, and they're actually not. So you actually wear a lot of different hats in your Christian life with God. You are a child of God. You are a servant of God. You are a soldier of God. You're a saint of God. You're all of these things. And you are a friend of God. Even in your human relationships, you do that, right? Like you have a lot of different roles that you play in your marriage. Here's the thing. You better know which one is the main one. You have a lot of different roles that you play as a parent with your kids. You better know which one is the main one. Jesus is going to pick this apart in a passage. I'm going to give this to you. This John 15, 15. Through that lens, look at what Jesus is saying here because it's, it's massive. Now, he says this. This is at the Last Supper, right before he goes to the cross. Him and his 12 disciples, and they're sitting there, and he says this. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Now his word friends there, it's the first time he's going to say it. This is going to be massive. And what Jesus is going to say is, this is the hat that matters the most with you and God. Friend, you are my friends if you do what I command. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all that I've heard from my father I have made known to you. Now, that's a lot of brainy stuff in there. Maybe you're trying to pull it all apart right now. Let me just, you can go back and read it later. I'm just going to tell you the main point there. Jesus was used to looking at Christians, to looking at God's people and saying, I know you see yourself as the servant of God, and that's good. Like that, that, should, that should flow out of our love for him, right? Like God has saved us. I will devote my life to him. I'll do whatever he tells me to do, right? Like Jesus, if you want to send me to Africa, send me to Africa, let's go, right? Like you want me to be a missionary in some foreign land? I will be a missionary. Like I will be in a monastery. Like you tell me what to do, I will do it. Because I radically saved, like I didn't deserve and now you gave and you, yes. Like all of that should flow. But he's saying that you being a servant of God, that's not the main hat. The main hat is you're the friend of God and you love God and God loves you. And that's actually the first thing. And don't lose sight of the fact that that's the first thing. In Exodus 33, 11, if you're taking notes, I'm not gonna have this one on your screen. It's talking about the relationship of God and Moses in the Old Testament. Moses, who was at the burning bush, later on, as it describes the relationship between Moses and God, it says that God spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. Friend 
is a big word in the Old Testament. It only gets used for a few of the saints or patriarchs in the Old Testament. Abraham in James 2.23 and in several other spots too was called the friend of God. God didn't just hand out that title to anybody. Abraham, Moses, and now Jesus does come to his disciples at the Last Supper and said, you're my friends and I'm not calling you servants anymore. Let that set in because he's also saying it to us. The point of today's message is we need to refine this again to be the friend of God. Not just good Christian soldiers. Anybody grow up singing that? Onward Christian soldiers? Amen. It's part of it. But it's not the main thing. And we got to know what the main thing is. Because the main thing is what's supposed to bubble over. And everything else comes from that. You are the friend of God. And this is making some of you already feel really uncomfortable in the room today. Because this friend stuff, it's all touchy-feely, Yeah. We don't like the touchy-feely stuff. Just give me the logic stuff, Pastor. Just give me the stuff I can understand, the stuff I can process, the stuff I can categorize. Give me that kind of stuff. Give me something to do because that feels easier, feels better. But all the touchy-feely stuff about me and God, and there's supposed to be love there, and I'm the bride of Christ, and that feels weird. And then I go into the Psalms, and it's using kind of like romantic language between me and God. Why in the world is that stuff there? Anybody else get weirded out by that? Come on. Of course we do. That is the psalmist trying to figure out language to say this love is actually the main thing. And I know it's weird. But he's talking about real, passionate love for God, not just obedience. Amen. This is affection. This is being preoccupied with God, crazy about God. How many of you went to that Linger conference last night? Let me see a show of hands here real quick. Own up to it. There we go. Okay. All right, so we were with Pastor Jonathan last night, and he talked about don't just agape love your spouse, cherish your spouse. Remember that? I had to go home that night and rewrite a whole bunch of this just to make sure we were in line with the, I'm just kidding. But his word was cherish. And cherish meant emotion. Cherish meant I'm crazy in love with you. And that's, that's kind of the way that the romantic relationship begins. And then we all kind of get used to the fact that it starts to mellow out. Don't let it mellow out. That's what he was advocating for last night. Make a conscious choice to keep cherishing, to be preoccupied with the other person. He said, even be biased toward them. Always choose them. Don't choose anybody else. Just choose them. Talk them up. Praise them. See their positives. Call that stuff out. Always want to be with them, yeah? Always want to be with them. He even talked about our differences, and sometimes our differences can like annoy us just a bit. And he said, why don't you acknowledge that creator God made them exactly this way? And don't just submit that creator God, submit to the idea that creator God made them this way. How about you worship God for making them this way? How about you love the fact that God made them this way? How about you adore the fact that God made my wife, Linda, exactly like this? It's a different level. Do you see how friendship and love is the beginning and everything else flows rightly out of it? Otherwise, we find ourselves in dead religious uh, structures all the time. It happens to us. We don't even know it's happening to us. Um, there's a spot in the book of Revelation where Jesus is writing a letter to a church. And he actually, if you, if you know that section of scripture, it's chapter two and chapter three. He writes seven different letters to th seven different churches. And they're all in different spots spiritually. And so he goes in there and he diagnoses them and tells them what to do. And this one church was called Ephesus. And he walks into that church and he says, this is, this is what's going on. He says, you're doing all the duty stuff right. He's like, you are great Christians in that church. He's like, not only that, but you've been faithful. And not only that, but there's been false teaching and other things. And you guys have, have stood for the right like you've, you've done so well. He said, but this I have against you. You've lost your first love. 
So it's like, you've been great Christians. You've been great servants of God. You've stuck to the word of God, but you lost love. So love is not the same as these things. Don't miss that. Love's this different thing that he has in mind. And he's like, when you lost your first love that was on fire in the beginning, he's like, that matters to me. He's like, if you don't get that first love back as God's people, he's like, I'll remove your lampstand from its place. And what's he saying there? Lampstand is this idea. Jesus had talked about it. When you've got the faith, when you've got this relationship with God, it's like a lamp goes up on a stand so that people can see it. So that people who are spiritually hungry because God's made them spiritually, spiritually hungry and thirsty for the real Jesus, they will look up and say, where's a lamp at? And they'll follow that light and they'll get to you, right? Like you are a lamp on a stand and a church is also that way. But he's like, if you don't find your first love back, I'm gonna remove your lampstand because the people that are actually hungry and thirsty, I don't want them coming to your church. Because they're not gonna find the real thing. It's that serious to God. You can't be so obedient, such a servant, such Bible knowledge, and you've got all the theology down. You can't do all of those things and just skip the love and it'd be okay. You gotta have the love. Last year, I took a sabbatical. I was gone for two and a half weeks and went to Colorado. And um, I've, I've told this church much about this and explained things. And, and some of you guys already know the story. I was in a very spiritually low place and I needed God to bring some revival to me. And so the elders sent me away and said, go in a cabin in Colorado and figure yourself out, true blood. They didn't say that. <laughs> but I went there and shut off all the, the electronics, no TV, no laptop, no phone, no nothing. It was just me. The puppy was there. She doesn't count in this story, at least. Um, but I was, it was just me and, and total silence and no work to do. Um, some of the elders even said, we're not even going to give you books to read or work to do while you're there. Like, like no, no, just, just sit before God. So wise. <clears throat> and so the first several days, I started to get frustrated because I'm, I'm just so used to doing stuff. All of a sudden, you stop doing stuff, and you're like, who am I? Like, <laughs> just doesn't make sense. So, and, and, and not only am I not doing stuff, uh, as a pastor, is my purpose. None of you were there, by the way. I couldn't do anything for you. So, yeah, purpose and pastor was just gone. And none of my kids were around, so parent was gone. Linda wasn't there, at least for the first week or so. So husband is kind of gone, and, and it was just me, and just silence, and just a Bible. And what do you do with that? And after some of the frustration passed, and you're there, and, and I start praying and asking God what all this means, and he said, here's what all this means. It means when you peel everything away, you're still my son. Amen. When you peel everything else away, and, and by the way, you're not doing anything for me right now. It's, it's not like the kingdom of God just came to a screeching halt because Josh Trueblood didn't start doing stuff. It's not like my, my grace for you and my love for you stopped because you were no longer earning every single day what, you know how we think? I woke up and maybe I yelled at Linda or I woke up and I didn't do my quiet time. So God must be against me today. All those things that we do to each other, to ourselves, sorry. And God said, you're my son. And, and we have this. And by the way, this is enough. If you had none of the rest, this is enough. And, and the, here's the second thought that hit me. This is what I had in the beginning. I didn't have any of the stuff. I just had him and he was enough. And not only, I wasn't settling he is enough. He was enough. He was everything to me. Do you remember those days? Yeah. Do you remember those days when you first got shockingly saved? And God took me back there and, and it blew my mind. Luke seven thirty six. Here's someone else who was blown away like this. 
one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that Jesus was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfumes. And then she knelt behind Jesus. Do you see the scene? Some of you already know it, but you got to imagine it in your mind. Jesus is there leaning on his knees against the table. That's how they would have done it. They're all eating dinner. This, wo this woman walks in. She, she bends down behind Jesus and starts weeping onto his feet. And her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. And then she kept kissing Jesus' feet and putting perfume on them. She's not there as a servant. She's not there obeying one of the Ten Commandments. She's just there worshiping. She's there adoring. She's there being preoccupied with Jesus. That's a choice. Right? She's not off playing video games. She's not pursuing an aggressive career. She's not preoccupied with her kids or preoccupied with her house and all of her chores. What's she preoccupied with? She's preoccupied with Jesus. Why? Because she's been radically saved. It calls her an immoral woman. We're going to find out in a few verses that Jesus had forgiven her. And so she goes from massive sinful life to massive forgiveness. And that leads her to massive thankfulness and worship and love. And Jesus is going to talk about that. Real salvation had taken place. And I believe it was a shock to her. When I first got saved, I was at a shocking place. Have you ever been there? where I knew consciously that what I had done against God, against his law, against the people I loved, was enough to get me straight to hell. I knew it. I knew God had forgiven me for all of that, and I was shocked as a result, startled by grace. If you've experienced that, you've experienced that. Part of the way that it works for me the Holy Spirit just did this. As I was contemplating in those early days, what's going on here right now? And I didn't understand anything, okay? But God gave me these two thoughts in, in sequence and it blew my mind. First off, he reminded me of a moment where one of my closest friends in a room full of people at a, at a party uh, humiliated me, treated me like dirt. didn't act like a friend, act like he had been using me all along, and it cut me. I didn't think about it often, but you've had those things, and you know it. I can imagine the moment right now, all these years later, it cut me. God reminded me of that. And then he reminded me of this girl that I had been dating at the same exact time. And this is not Linda. I was using her. I did not know her very well. I did not care about her. I showed no care toward her. I just used her. Selfish. It was cruel. And God re reminded me of the first one and his cruelty toward me, that guy's cruelty toward me. And then he reminded me of the second one and said, that was you toward her. And I was guilty before the Lord. Have you ever been guilty before the Lord? Amen. The Holy Spirit came in and he declared judgment and he was right and I was wrong and I knew it. And then he saved me. And then he forgave me and said, finally, you get it. This is what the cross was all about all along. It was dying for this, this thing that you got a one-way ticket to hell for. And you deserved every bit of it. Sorry. And when you know it in your bones, you know it. Have you been rocked by grace before? Have you been shocked and rattled and startled by what God has done for you? Because I was in that moment and it's the only way I can describe how in the world that woman got behind Jesus' feet and started crying on his feet. Because it makes no logical sense what she's doing. No one asked her to do that. 
She had no other reaction except for love for a savior. She was crazy about him. Have you been in that place? Do you want to be there again? Luke 7, 39, Jesus explains more. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, this is Simon talking. If this man were a prophet, he would know that this kind of woman is touching him and she's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, freaky when Jesus answers your thoughts, amen? Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Why is Simon criticizing Jesus in this moment and criticizing her? Because he has not been shocked by grace. He does not realize how much he's been forgiven for. It's not because he's perfectly holy. It's because he doesn't realize how much he's blown it with God. Verse 41, then Jesus told him the story. A man loaned money to two people, Simon. 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces of silver to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. Simon gets the logic of the story, but he doesn't realize what it means. Verse 44, that's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust of my feet, but she washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, Simon, but from the moment that I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. Verse 46, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, Simon, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Can you go back to the slide right before this one? Do you notice there, right at the top, verse 44, it says that he turned to the woman and said to Simon, don't miss this. So you got to see Jesus sitting there and he makes his speech about the silver. But while he goes to make this speech and explain the whole thing, he doesn't take his eyes off the woman. You've seen that in conversation. I'm talking to you, but I'm looking at him. (laughs) Why does Jesus do that? It's weird. Because he's explaining her actions and she is adoring God. She is preoccupied with God. She is loving and worshiping God. And Jesus is receiving her worship. That's why he's looking at her. There's an old song that says, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my king. Do you know the song? Take joy, my king, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound to your ear. That song is nuts because it's got this idea in it that you could sing a song and that almighty God would feel moved by you. And that goes against everything that you've been taught in school. The idea that you are small in this universe, you are insignificant, you are just a number and a statistic and you don't matter. Because the more we see about how big this universe is, the more small we feel in it, I get it, but it doesn't mean we're insignificant because the king says no. Take joy, my king, in what you hear. Maybe you would be moved, God, on your throne just by the simple song that I sing to you because you see through to my heart. Is that even possible? Not because of the goodness of my song, but how open and good and humble and loving you are toward me that you would see me. And Jesus shows it. He can't stop staring at her. He's receiving her worship. Let me say this. We're going to go into a time of communion here in just a second. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to give your love to God, your worship to God. Maybe God will fan into flame the fire again for you. Don't know. Maybe God will cause you to be shocked by his grace. I talked to somebody after first service and they're like, what if I've never been shocked by his grace? 
if you've never been, ask him today. Lord, would you take me to that miraculous, mysterious place of being shocked by you? For me, not someone else describing the experience that they had. For me, God, take me there. See what he does. But let me just say about the woman here, because this is some of you maybe. She's not perfect in that moment, but she is preoccupied with Jesus. And sometimes we miss what a simple choice that is. To not be a perfect person and getting everything in your life right for God, but to simply be preoccupied with him. That's where the love is, guys. Like I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna go to bed and I'm gonna give him my heart. Give him my attention. I'm gonna choose him and I'm gonna not choose some other things. And I'm gonna go to him. She was preoccupied and not perfect. When she's sitting there crying and weeping over his feet, do you think everything in her inside was like all of her thoughts? Do you think they were all well-ordered and saintly? I don't know that they were. Maybe she had a lot of doubts. Maybe she was feeling some humiliation. Maybe she's sitting there weeping and, and, and she's loving Jesus and she's, she's thankful for everything that he's done, but she's simultaneously wondering, what does this Pharisee think of me? Maybe all of that was going on. Can I, I just want to say that because for some of us here in the room, we can get like that. We can go to bring our offering. We can bring our prayer. We can bring our communion to God. And you can sit there and you can judge yourself in your seat and say, I don't feel very saintly right now. So maybe this isn't love. Just be preoccupied with him. Yes? I'm gonna pray and then Jeremy's gonna come up and he's gonna walk us through communion together. Lord Jesus, we adore you. We don't just obey and follow and serve. God, we adore you today. You have done all things well. Thank you for dying for us as your friends. Thank you for dying for us to restore friendship. God, we give you this time now. In Christ's name.